article one of theodore winthrop a civil war narrative aborted by death this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales theodore winthrop a civil war narrative aborted by death by theodore winthrop article one our march to washington part one through the city at three o'clock in the afternoon of friday april nineteenth we took our peacemaker a neat twelve-pound brass howitzer down from the seventh regiment armory and stationed it in the rear of the building the twin peacemaker is somewhere near us but entirely hidden by this enormous crowd an enormous crowd of both sexes of every age and condition the men offer all kinds of truculent and patriotic hopes the women shed tears and say god bless you boys this is a part of the town where baddish cigars prevail but good or bad i am ordered to keep all away from the gun so the throng stands back peers curiously over the heads of its junior members and seems to be taking the measure of my coffin after a patient hour of this the word is given we fall in our two guns find their places at the right of the line of march we move on through the thickening crowd at a great house on the left as we pass the astor library i see a handkerchief waving for me yes it is she who made the sandwiches in my knapsack they were a trifle too thick as i afterwards discovered but otherwise perfection be these my thanks and the thanks of hungry comrades who had bites of them at the corner of great jones street we halted for half an hour then everything ready we marched down broadway it was worth a life that march only one who passed as we did through that tempest of cheers two miles long can know the terrible enthusiasm of the occasion i could hardly hear the rattle of our own gun carriages and only once or twice the music of our band came to me muffled and quelled by the uproar we knew now if we had not before divined it that our great city was with us as one man utterly united in the great cause we were marching to sustain this great fact i learned by two senses if hundreds of thousands roared it into my ears thousands slapped it into my back my fellow citizens smote me on the knapsack as i went by at the gun rope and encouraged me each in his own dialect bully for you alternated with benedictions in the proportion of two bullies to one blessing i was not so fortunate as to receive more substantial tokens of sympathy but there were parting gifts showered on the regiment enough to establish a variety shop handkerchiefs of course came floating down upon us from the windows like a snow pretty little gloves pelted us with love taps the sterner sex forced upon us pocket knives new and jagged combs soap slippers boxes of matches cigars by the dozen and the hundred pipes to smoke shag and pipes to smoke latakia fruit eggs and sandwiches one fellow got a new purse with ten bright quarter eagles at the corner of grand street or thereabouts a boy in a red flannel shirt and black dress pantaloons leaning back against the crowd with herculean shoulders called me say bully take my dorg he's one of the kind that holds till he draps this gentleman with his animal was instantly shoved back by the police and the seventh lost the dorg these were the comic incidents of the march but underlying all was the tragic sentiment that we might have tragic work presently to do the news of the rascal attack in baltimore on the massachusetts sixth had just come in ours might be the same chance if there were any of us not in earnest before the story of the day would steady us so we said good-bye to broadway moved down Cortland street under a bower of flags and at half-past six shoved off in the ferry-boat everybody has heard how jersey city turned out and filled up the railroad station like an opera house to give god speed to us as a representative body a guarantee of the unquestioning loyalty of the conservative class in new york 
everybody has heard how the state of new jersey along the railroad line stood through the evening and the night to shout their quota of good wishes at every station the jersey men were there uproarious as jerseymen to shake our hands and wish us a happy dispatch i think i did not see a rod of ground without its man from dusk till dawn from the hudson to the delaware upon the train we made a jolly night of it all knew that the more a man sings the better he is likely to fight so we sang more than we slept and in fact that has been our history ever since philadelphia at sunrise we were at the station in philadelphia and dismissed for an hour some hundreds of us made up broad street for the la pierre house for breakfast when i arrived i found every place at table filled and every waiter ten deep with orders so being an old campaigner i followed up the stream of provender to the fountain head the kitchen half a dozen other old campaigners were already there most hospitably entertained by the cooks they served us hot and hot with the best of their best straight from the gridiron and the pan i hope if i live to breakfast again in the lapierre house that i may be allowed to help myself and choose for myself below stairs when we rendezvoused at the train we found that the orders were for every man to provide himself three days ration in the neighborhood and be ready for a start at a moment's notice a mountain of bread was already piled up in the station i stuck my bayonet through a stout loaf and with a dozen comrades armed in the same way went foraging about for other viver it is a poor part of philadelphia but whatever they had in the shops or the houses seemed to be at our disposition i stopped at a corner shop to ask for pork and was amicably assailed by an earnest dame irish i am pleased to say she thrust her last loaf upon me and sighed that it was not baked that morning for my honour's service a little farther on two kindly quaker ladies compelled me to step in what could they do they asked eagerly they had no meat in the house but could we eat eggs they had in the house a dozen and a half new laid so the pot to the fire and the eggs boiled and bagged by myself and that tall saxon my friend e of the sixth company while the eggs simmered the two ladies thee'd us prayerfully and tearfully hoping that god would save our country from blood unless blood must be shed to preserve law and liberty nothing definite from baltimore when we returned to the station we stood by waiting orders about noon the eighth massachusetts regiment took the train southward our regiment was ready to a man to try its strength with the plug uglies if there had been any voting on the subject the plan to follow the straight road to washington would have been accepted by acclamation but the higher powers deemed that the longest way round was the shortest way home and no doubt their decision was wise the event proved it at two o'clock came the word to fall in we handled our howitzers again and marched down jefferson avenue to the steamer boston to embark to embark for what port for washington of course finally but by what route that was to remain in doubt to us privates for a day or two the boston is a steamer of the outside line from philadelphia to new york she just held our legion we tramped on board and were allotted about the craft from the top to the bottom story we took tents traps and grub on board and steamed away down the delaware in the sweet afternoon of april if ever the heavens smiled fair weather on any campaign they have done so on ours the boston soldiers on shipboard are proverbially fish out of water we could not be called by the good old nickname of lobsters by the crew our gray jackets saved the sobriquet but we floundered about the crowded vessel like boiling victims in a pot at last we found our places and laid ourselves upon the decks to tan or bronze or burn scarlet according to complexion there were plenty of cheeks of lobster hue before next evening on the boston a thousand young fellows turned loose on shipboard were sure to make themselves merry let the reader imagine that 
we were like any other excursionists except that the stacks of bright guns were always present to remind us of our errand and regular guard mounting and drill went on all the time the young citizens growled or laughed at the minor hardships of the hasty outfit and toughened rapidly to business sunday the twenty first was a long and somewhat anxious day while we were bowling along in the sweet sunshine and sweeter moonlight of the halcyon time uncle sam might be dethroned by somebody in buckram or baltimore burnt by the boys from lynn and marblehead revenging the massacre of their fellows every one begins to comprehend the fiery eagerness of men who live in historic times i wish i had control of chain lightning for a few minutes says o the droll fellow of our company i'd make it come thick and heavy and knock spots out of secession at early dawn of monday the twenty second after feeling along slowly all night we see the harbor of annapolis a frigate with sails unbent lies at anchor she flies the stars and stripes hurrah a large steamboat is aground further in as soon as we can see anything we catch the glitter of bayonets on board by and by boats come off and we get news that the steamer is the maryland a ferry-boat of the philadelphia and baltimore railroad the massachusetts eighth regiment had been just in time to seize her on the north side of the chesapeake they learned that she was to be carried off by the crew and leave them blockaded so they shot their zouaves ahead as skirmishers the fine fellows rattled on board and before the steamboat had time to take a turn or open a valve she was held by massachusetts in trust for uncle sam hurrah for the most important prize thus far in the war it probably saved the constitution old ironsides from capture by the traitors it probably saved annapolis and kept maryland open without bloodshed as soon as the massachusetts regiment had made prize of the ferry-boat a call was made for engineers to run her some twenty men at once stepped to the front we of the new york seventh afterwards concluded that whatever was needed in the way of skill or handicraft could be found among those brother yankees they were the men to make armies of they could tailor for themselves shoe themselves do their own blacksmithing gunsmithing and all other work that calls for sturdy arms and nimble fingers in fact i have such profound confidence in the universal accomplishment of the massachusetts eighth that i have no doubt if the order were poets to the front painters present arms sculptors charge bayonets a baker's dozen out of every company would respond well to go on with their story when they had taken their prize they drove her straight downstream to annapolis the nearest point to washington there they found the naval academy in danger of attack and old ironsides serving as a practice ship for the future midshipmen also exposed the call was now for seamen to man the old craft and save her from a worse enemy than her prototype met in the guerriere seamen of course they were marblehead men gloucester men beverly men seamen all par excellence they clapped on the frigate to aid the middies and by and by started her out into the stream in doing this their own pilot took the chance to run them purposely on a shoal in the intricate channel a great error of judgment on his part as he perceived when he found himself in irons and in confinement the days of trifling with traitors are over think the eighth regiment of massachusetts but there they were hard and fast on the shoal when we came up nothing to nibble on but knobs of anthracite nothing to sleep on softer or cleaner than coal dust nothing to drink but the brackish water under their keel rather rough as they afterwards patiently told us meantime the constitution had got hold of a tug and was making her way to an anchorage where her guns commanded everything and everybody good and true men chuckled greatly over this the stars and stripes also were still up at the fort at the naval academy our dread that while we were off at sea some great and perhaps fatal harm had been suffered was greatly lightened by these good omens if annapolis was safe why not washington safe also 
if treachery had got head at the capital would not treachery have reached out its hand and snatched this doorway these were our speculations as we began to discern objects before we heard news but news came presently boats pulled off to us our officers were put into communication with the shore the scanty facts of our position became known from man to man we privates have greatly the advantage in battling with the doubt of such a time we know that we have nothing to do with rumors orders are what we go by and orders are facts we lay a long lingering day off annapolis the air was full of doubt and we were eager to be let loose all this while the maryland stuck fast on the bar we could see them half a mile off making every effort to lighten her the soldiers tramped forward and aft danced on her decks shot overboard a heavy baggage truck we saw them start the truck for the stern with a cheer it crashed down one end stuck in the mud the other fell back and rested on the boat they were at it with axes and presently it was clear as the tide rose we gave our grounded friends a lift with a hawser no go the boston tugged in vain we got near enough to see the whites of the massachusetts eyes and their unlucky faces and uniforms all grimy with their lodgings in the coal dust they could not have been blacker if they had been breathing battle smoke and dust all day that experience was clear gain to them by and by greatly to the delight of the impatient seventh the boston was headed for shore never speak ill of the beast you bestraddle therefore requiescat boston may her ribs lie light on soft sand when she goes to pieces may her engines be cut up into bracelets for the arms of the patriotic fair good-bye to her dear old close dirty slow coach she served her country well in a moment of trial who knows but she saved it it was a race to see who should first get to washington and we and the virginia mob in alliance with the district mob were perhaps nip and tuck for the goal annapolis so the seventh regiment landed and took annapolis we were the first troops ashore the middies of the naval academy no doubt believe that they had their quarters secure the massachusetts boys are satisfied that they first took the town in charge and so they did but the seventh took it a little more not of course from its loyal men but for its loyal men for loyal maryland and for the union has anybody seen annapolis it is a picturesque old place sleepy enough and astonished to find itself wide awaked by a war and obliged to take responsibility and share for good and ill in the movement of its time the buildings of the naval academy stand parallel with the river severn with a green plateau toward the water and a lovely green lawn toward the town all the scene was fresh and fair with april and i fancied as the boston touched the wharf that i discerned the sweet fragrance of apple blossoms coming with the springtime airs i hope that the companies of the seventh should the day arrive will charge upon horrid batteries or serried ranks with as much alacrity as they marched ashore on the greensward of the naval academy we disembarked and were halted in line between the buildings and the river presently while we stood at ease people began to arrive some with smallish fruit to sell some with smaller news to give nobody knew whether washington was taken nobody knew whether jeff davis was now spitting in the presidential spittoon and scribbling his dispatches with the nib of the presidential goose quill we were absolutely in doubt whether a seemingly inoffensive knot of rustics on a mound without the enclosure might not at tap of drum unmask a battery of giant columbiads and belch blazes at us raking our line nothing so entertaining happened it was a parade not a battle at sunset our band played strains sweet enough to pacify all secession if secession had music in its soul coffee hot from the coppers of the naval school and biscuit were served out to us and while we supped we talked with our visitors such as were allowed to approach first the boys of the school 
fine little blue jackets, had their story to tell. "'Do you see that white farmhouse across the river?' says a brave pygmy of a chap in navy uniform. "'That is headquarters for secession. They were going to take the school from us, sir, and the frigate. But we've got ahead of em now you and the Massachusetts boys have come down.' And he twinkled all over with delight. "'We can't study any more. We are on guard all the time. We've got howitzers, too, and we'd like you to see tomorrow on drill how we can handle em one of their boats came by our sentry last night a sentry probably five feet high and he blazed away sir so they thought they wouldn't try us that time it was plain that these young souls had been well tried by the treachery about them they too had felt the pang of the disloyalty of comrades nearly a hundred of the boys had been spoilt by the base example of their elders in the repudiating states and had resigned after the middies came anxious citizens from the town scared all of them now that we were come and assured them that persons and property were to be protected they ventured to speak of the disgusting tyranny to which they american citizens had been subjected we came into contact here with utter social anarchy no man unless he was ready to risk assault loss of property exile dared to act or talk like a free man this great wrong must be righted think the seventh regiment as one man so we tried to reassure the annapolitans that we meant to do our duty as the nation's armed police and mob law was to be put down so far as we could do it here too voices of war met us the country was stirred up if the rural population did not give us a bastard imitation of lexington and concord as we tried to gain washington all plug ugly dumb would treat us a la plug ugly somewhere near the junction of the annapolis and baltimore and washington railroad the seventh must be ready to shoot at dusk we were marched up to the academy and quartered about in the buildings some in the fort some in the recitation halls we lay down on our blankets and knapsacks. Up to this time our sleep and diet had been severely scanty. We stayed all next day at Annapolis. The Boston brought the Massachusetts Eighth ashore that night. Poor fellows, what a figure they cut when we found them bivouacked on the Academy grounds next morning. To begin, they had come off in hot patriotic haste, half uniformed and half outfitted finding that baltimore had been taken by its own loafers and traitors and that the chesapeake ferry was impractical had obliged them to change line of march they were out of grub they were parched dry for want of water on the ferry boat nobody could decipher caucasian much less bunker hill yankee in their grimy visages but hungry thirsty grimy these fellows were grit massachusetts ought to be proud of such hardy cheerful faithful sons we of the seventh are proud for our part that it was our privilege to share our rations with them and to begin a fraternization which grows closer every day and will be historical but i must make a shorter story we drilled and were reviewed that morning on the academy parade in the afternoon the naval school paraded their last before they gave up their barracks to the coming soldiery so ended the twenty third of april midnight twenty fourth we were rattled up by an alarm perhaps a sham one to keep us awake and lively in a moment the whole regiment was in order of battle in the moonlight on the parade it was a most brilliant spectacle as company after company rushed forward with rifles glittering to take their places in the array after this pretty spurt we were rationed with pork beef and bread for three days and ordered to be ready to march on the instant end of article one part one Article One, Part Two of Theodore Winthrop, A Civil War Narrative Aborted by Death, by Theodore Winthrop. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Article One, Our March to Washington, Part Two. What the Massachusetts Eighth had been doing. Meantime, General Butler's command, the Massachusetts Eighth, had been busy knocking disorder in the head 
presently after their landing and before they were refreshed they pushed companies out to occupy the railroad track beyond the town they found it torn up no doubt the scamps who did the shabby job fancied that there would be no more travel that way until strawberry time they fancied the yankees would sit down on the fences and begin to whittle white oak toothpicks darning the rebels through their noses meanwhile i know these men of the eighth can whittle and i presume they can say darn it if occasion requires but just now track laying was the business at hand wanted experienced track layers was the word along the files all at once the line of the road became densely populated with experienced track layers fresh from massachusetts presto change the rails were relaid spiked and the roadway leveled and better ballasted than any road i ever saw south of mason and dixon's line we must leave a good job for these folks to model after say the massachusetts eighth a track without a train is as useless as a gun without a man train and engine must be had uncle sam's mails and troops cannot be stopped another minute our energetic friends conclude so the railroad company's people being either frightened or false in marches massachusetts to the station we the people of the united states want rolling stock for the use of the union they said or words to that effect the engine a frowsy machine at the best had been purposely disabled here appeared the deus ex machina charles homans beverly light guard company e eighth massachusetts regiment that is the man name and titles in full and he deserves well of his country he took a quiet squint at the engine it was as helpless as a boned turkey and he found charles homans his mark written all over it the old rattletrap was an old friend charles homans had had a share in building it the machine and the man said how'd you do at once homans called for a gang of engine builders of course they swarmed out of the ranks they passed their hands over the locomotive a few times and presently it was ready to whistle and wheeze and rumble and gallop as if no traitor had ever tried to steal the go and the music out of it this had all been done during the afternoon of the twenty-third during the night the renovated engine was kept cruising up and down the track to see all clear guards of the eighth were also posted to protect passage our commander had i presume been cooperating with general butler in the business the naval academy authorities had given us every dispatch and assistance and the middies frank personal hospitality the day was halcyon the grass was green and soft the apple trees were just in blossom it was a day to be remembered many of us will remember it and show the marks of it for months as the day we had our heads cropped by evening there was hardly one pole in the seventh tenable by anybody's grip most sat in the shade and were shorn by a barber a few were honored with a clip by the artist hand of the petit caparral of our engineer company while i rattle off these trifling details let me not fail to call attention to the grave service done by our regiment by its arrival at the nick of time at annapolis no clearer special providence could have happened the country people of the traitor sort were aroused baltimore and its mob were but two hours away the constitution had been hauled out of reach of a rush by the massachusetts men first on the ground but was half manned and not fully secure and there lay the maryland helpless on the shoal with six or seven hundred souls on board so near the shore that the late captain rinder's gun could have sunk her from some ambush yes the seventh regiment at annapolis was the right man in the right place our morning march reveille as nobody pronounces this word a la francaise as everybody calls it reveille why not drop it as an affectation and translate it the stir your stumps the peel your eyes the tumble up or literally the wake our snorers had kept up this call so lustily since midnight that when the drum sounded we were all ready the sixth and second companies under captain nevers are detached to lead the band 
i see my brother billy march off with the sixth into the dusk half moonlight half dawn and hope that no beggar of a secessionist will get a pat shot at him by the roadside without his getting a chance to let fly in return such little possibilities intensify the earnest detestation we feel for the treasons we come to resist and to punish there will be some bitter work done if we ever get to blows in this war this needless reckless brutal assault upon the mildest of all governments before the main body of the regiment marches we learn that the baltic and other transports came in last night with troops from new york and new england enough to hold annapolis against a square league of plug uglies we do not go on without having our rear protected and our communications open it is strange to be compelled to think of these things in peaceful america but we really know little more of the country before us than cortez knew of mexico i have since learned from a high official that thirteen different messengers were dispatched from washington in the interval of anxiety while the seventh was not forthcoming and only one got through at half-past seven we take up our line of march pass out of the charming grounds of the academy and move through the quiet rusty picturesque old town it has a romantic dullness annapolis which deserves a parting compliment although we deem ourselves a fine-looking set although our belts are blanched with pipe clay and our rifles shine sharp in the sun yet the townspeople stare at us in a dismal silence they have already the air of men quelled by a despotism none can trust his neighbor if he dares to be loyal he must take his life into his hands most would be loyal if they dared but the system of society which has ended in this present chaos has gradually eliminated the bravest and best men they have gone in search of freedom and prosperity and now the bullies cow the weaker brothers there must be an end of this mean tyranny think the seventh as they march through old annapolis and see how sick the town is with doubt and alarm outside the town we strike the railroad and move along the howitzers in front bouncing over the sleepers when our line is fully disengaged from the town we halt here the scene is beautiful the van rests upon a high embankment with a pool surrounded by pine trees on the right green fields on the left cattle are feeding quietly about the air sings with birds the chestnut leaves sparkle frogs whistle in the warm spring morning the regiment groups itself along the bank and the cutting several marylanders of the half price age under twelve come gaping up to see us harmless invaders each of these young gentry is armed with a dead spring frog perhaps by way of tribute and here hello here comes horace greeley in propria persona he marches through our groups with the greeley walk the greeley hat on the back of his head the greeley white coat on his shoulders his trousers much too short and an absorbed abstracted demeanour can it be horace reporting for himself no this is a maryland production and a little disposed to be sulky after a few minutes halt we hear the whistle of the engine this machine is also an historic character in the war remember it j h nicholson is its name charles homans drives and on either side stands a sentry with fixed bayonet new spectacles for america but it is grand to know that the bayonets are to protect not to assail liberty and law the train leads off we follow by the track presently the train returns we pass it and trudge on in light marching order carrying arms blankets haversacks and canteens our knapsacks are upon the train fortunate for our backs that they do not have to bear any more burden for the day grows sultry it is one of those breezeless baking days which brew thunder gusts we march on for some four miles when coming upon the guards of the massachusetts eighth our howitzer is ordered to fall out and wait for the train with a comrade of the artillery i am placed on guard over it on guard with howitzer number two henry bonnell is my fellow sentry 
he like myself is an old campaigner in such campaigns as our generation has known so we talk california oregon indian life the plains keeping our eyes peeled meanwhile and ranging the country men that will tear up track are quite capable of picking off a sentry a giant chestnut gives us little dots of shade from its pygmy leaves the country about us is open and newly ploughed some of the worm fences are new and ten rails high but the farming is careless and the soil thin two of the massachusetts men come back to the gun while we are standing there one is my friend stephen morris of marblehead sutton light infantry i had shared my breakfast yesterday with stephen so we refraternize his business is i make shoes in winter and fishing in summer he gives me a few facts suspicious persons seen about the track men on horseback in the distance one of the massachusetts guard last night challenged his captain captain replied officer of the night whereupon says stephen the recruit let squizzle and jess missed his ear he then related to me the incident of the railroad station the first thing they knowed says he we bit right into the depot and took charge i don't mind stephen replied i don't mind life nor yet death but whenever i see a massachusetts boy i stick by him and if them secessionists attack us to-night or any other time they'll get in debt whistle again and the train appears we are ordered to ship our howitzers on a platform car the engine pushes us on this train brings our light baggage and the rear guard a hundred yards further on is a delicious fresh spring below the bank while the train halts steve morris rushes down to fill my canteen this ain't like marblehead says stevens panting up but a man that can shin up them rocks can get right over this sand the train goes slowly on as a rickety train should at intervals we see the fresh spots of track just laid by our yankee friends near the sixth mile we began to overtake hot and uncomfortable squads of our fellows the unseasonable heat of this most breathless day was too much for many of the younger men unaccustomed to rough work and weakened by want of sleep and irregular food in our hurried movements thus far charles homan's private carriage was however ready to pick up tired men hot men thirsty men men with corns or men with blisters they tumbled into the train in considerable numbers an enemy that dared could have made a moderate bag of stragglers at this time but they would not have been allowed to straggle if any enemy had been about by this time we were convinced that no attack was to be expected in this part of the way the main body of the regiment under major schaller a tall soldierly fellow with a moustache of the fighting colour tramped on their own pens to the watering place eight miles or so from annapolis there troops and train came to a halt with the news that a bridge over a country road was broken a mile farther on it had been distinctly insisted upon in the usual southern style that we were not to be allowed to pass through maryland and that we were to be welcomed to hospitable graves the broken bridge was a capital spot for a skirmish why not look for it here we looked but got nothing the rascals could skulk about by night tear up rails and hide them where they might be found by a man with half an eye or half destroy a bridge but there was no shoot in them they have not faith enough in their cause to risk their lives for it even behind a tree or from one of these thickets choice spots for ambush so we had no battle there but a battle of the elements the volcanic heat of the morning was followed by a furious storm of wind and a smart shower the regiment wrapped themselves in their blankets and took their wedding with more or less satisfaction they were receiving a sample of all the different little miseries of a campaign and here let me say a word to my fellow volunteers actual and prospective in all the armies of all the states a soldier needs besides his soldierly drill one good feet two a good stomach three and after these come the good head and the good heart but good feet are distinctly the first thing 
without them you cannot get to your duty if a comrade or a horse or a locomotive takes you on its back to the field you are useless there and when the field is lost you cannot retire run away and save your bacon good shoes and plenty of walking make good feet a man who pretends to belong to an infantry company ought always to keep himself in training so that any moment he can march twenty or thirty miles without feeling a pang or raising a blister was this the case with even a decimation of the army who rushed to defend washington were you so trained my comrades of the seventh a captain of a company who will let his men march with such shoes as i have seen on the feet of some poor fellows in this war ought to be garroted with shoestrings or at least compelled to play pope and wash the feet of the whole army of the apostles of liberty if you find a foot soldier lying beat out by the roadside desperate as a seasick man five to one his heels are too high or his soles too narrow or too thin or his shoe is not made straight on the inside so that the great toe can spread into its place as he treads i am an old walker over alps across the water and over corderillas sierras deserts and prairies at home i have done my near sixty miles a day without discomfort and speaking from large experience and with painful recollections of the suffering and death i have known for want of good feet on the march i say to every volunteer trust in god but keep your shoes easy the bridge when the frenzy of the brief tempest was over it began to be a question what to do about the broken bridge the gap was narrow but even charles homans could not promise to leap the j h nicholson over it who was to be our julius caesar in bridge building who but sergeant scott armorer of the regiment with my fellow sentry of the morning bono as first assistant scott called for a working party there were plenty of handy fellows among our engineers and in the line tools were plenty in the engineer's chest we pushed the platform car upon which howitzer number no. one was mounted down to the gap and began operations i wish says the petit caporal of the engineer company patting his howitzer gently on the back that i could get this putty blower pointed at the enemy while you fellows are bridge building the inefficient destructives of maryland had only half spoilt the bridge some of the old timbers could be used and for new ones there was the forest scott and his party made a good and quick job of it our friends of the massachusetts eighth had now come up they lent a ready hand as usual the sun set brilliantly by twilight there was a practical bridge the engine was dispatched back to keep the road open the two platform cars freighted with our howitzers were rigged with the gun ropes for dragging along the rail we passed through the files of the massachusetts men resting by the way and eating by the fires of the evening the suppers we had in great part provided them and so begins our night march the night march oh gottschalk what a poetic marche de nuit we then began to play with our heels and toes on the railroad track it was full moonlight and the night inexpressibly sweet and serene the air was cool and vivified by the gust and shower of the afternoon fresh spring was in every breath our fellows had forgotten that this morning they were hot and disgusted every one hugged his rifle as if it were the arm of the girl of his heart and stepped out gaily for the promenade tired or footsore men or even lazy ones could mount upon the two freight cars we were using for artillery wagons there were stout arms enough to tow the whole the scouts went ahead under first lieutenant farnham of the second company we were at school together i am afraid to say how many years ago he is just the same cool dry shrewd fellow he was as a boy and a most efficient officer it was an original kind of march i suppose a battery of howitzers never before found itself mounted upon cars ready to open fire at once and bang away into the offing with shrapnel or into the bushes with canister our line extended a half mile along the track 
It was beautiful to stand on the bank above a cutting and watch the files strike from the shadow of a wood into a broad flame of moonlight, every rifle sparkling up alert as it came forward. A beautiful sight to see the barrels writing themselves upon the dimness, each a silver flash. By and by, halt came, repeated along from the front, company after company. Halt! A rail gone! It was found without difficulty. The imbeciles who took it up probably supposed we would not wish to wet our feet by searching for it in the dewy grass of the next field. With incredible dollishness, they had also left the chairs and spikes beside the track. Bonnell took hold, and in a few minutes had the rail in place and firm enough to pass the engine. Remember, we were not only hurrying on to succor Washington, but opening the only convenient and practicable route between it and the loyal states. A little farther on we came to a village, a rare sight in this scantily peopled region. Here Sergeant Keeler of our company, the tallest man in the regiment and one of the handiest, suggested that we should tear up the rails at a turnout by the station and so be prepared for chances. So, out crowbars was the word. We tore up and bagged half a dozen rails, with chairs and spikes complete. Here, too, some of the engineers found a keg of spikes. This was also bagged and loaded on our cars. We fought the chaps with their own weapons, since they would not meet us with ours. These things made delay, and by and by there was a long halt, while the colonel communicated by orders sounded along the line with the engine. Holman's drag was hard after us, bringing our knapsacks and traps. After I had admired for some time the beauty of our moonlit line, and listened to the orders as they grew or died along the distance, I began to want excitement. Bonnell suggested that he and I should scout up the road and see if any rails were wanting. We traveled along into the quiet night. A mile ahead of the line, we suddenly caught the gleam of a rifle barrel. "'Who goes there?' one of our own scouts challenged smartly. We had arrived at the nick of time. Three rails were up. Two of them were easily found. The third was discovered by beating the bush thoroughly. Bonnell and I ran back for tools and returned at full trot with crowbar and sledge on our shoulders. There were plenty of willing hands to help too many, indeed, and with the aid of a huge Massachusetts man, we soon had the rail in place. From this time on we were constantly interrupted. Not a half-mile passed without a rail up. Bonnell was always at the front, laying track, and I am proud to say that he accepted me as aide-de-camp. Other fellows, unknown to me in the dark, gave hearty help. The seventh showed that it could do something else than drill." At one spot, on a high embankment over standing water, the rail was gone, sunk probably. Here we tried our rails brought from the turnout. They were too short. We supplemented with a length of plank from our stores. We rolled our cars carefully over. They passed safe. But Holmans shook his head. He could not venture a locomotive on that frail stuff. So we lost the society of the J. H. Nicholson. Next day the Massachusetts commander called for someone to dive in the pool for the lost rail. Plump into the water went a little wiry chap and grappled the rail. When I come up, says the brave fellow afterwards to me, our officer out with a twenty-dollar gold piece and wanted me to take it. That ain't what I came for, says I. Take it, says he, and share with the others. That ain't what they come for, says I. But I took a big cold the diver continued, and I'm condemned horsewit, which was the fact. Farther on we found a whole length of track torn up on both sides, sleepers and all, and the same thing repeated with alternations of breaks of single rails. Our howitzer ropes came into play to hoist and haul. We were not going to be stopped but it was becoming a noche triste to some of our comrades. We had now marched some sixteen miles. The distance was trifling, but the men had been on their legs pretty much all day and night. Hardly anyone had had any full or substantial sleep or meal since we started from New York. 
they napped off standing leaning on their guns dropping down in their tracks on the wet ground at every halt they were sleepy but plucky as we passed through deep cuttings places as it were built for defence there was a general desire that the tedium of the night should be relieved by a shindy during the whole night i saw our officers moving about the line doing their duty vigorously despite exhaustion hunger and sleeplessness about midnight our friends of the eighth had joined us and our whole little army struggled on together i find that i have been rather understating the troubles of the march it seems impossible that such difficulty could be encountered within twenty miles of the capital of our nation but we were making a rush to put ourselves in that capital and we could not proceed in the slow systematic way of an advancing army we must take the risk and stand the suffering whatever it was so the seventh regiment went through its bloodless noche triste morning at last we issued from the damp woods two miles below the railroad junction here was an extensive farm our vanguard had halted and borrowed a few rails to make fires these were of course carefully paid for at their proprietor's own price the fires were bright in the gray dawn about them the whole regiment was now halted the men stumbled down to catch forty winks some who were hungrier for food than sleep went off foraging among the farmhouses they returned with appetizing legends of hot breakfasts in hospitable abodes or scanty fare given grudgingly in hostile ones all meals however were paid for here as at other halts below the country people came up to talk to us the traitors could easily be distinguished by their insolence disguised as obsequiousness the loyal men were still timid but more hopeful at last all were very lavish with the monosyllabic sir it was an odd coincidence that the vanguard halting off at a farm in the morning found it deserted for the moment by its tenants and protected only by an engraved portrait of our former colonel duryea serenely smiling over the mantelpiece from this point the railroad was pretty much all gone but we were warmed and refreshed by a nap and a bite and besides had daylight and open country we put our guns on their own wheels all dropped into ranks as if on parade and marched the last two miles to the station we still had no certain information until we actually saw the train awaiting us and the washington companies who had come down to escort us drawn up we did not know whether our uncle sam was still a resident of the capital we packed into the train and rolled away to washington washington we marched up to the white house showed ourselves to the president made our bow to him as our host and then marched up to the capital our grand lodgings there we are now quartered in the representative's chamber and here i must hastily end this first sketch of the great defence may it continue to be as firm and faithful as it is this day i have scribbled my story with a thousand men stirring about me if any of my sentences miss their aim accuse my comrades and the bewilderment of this martial crowd for here are four or five thousand others on the same business as ourselves and drums are beating guns are clanking companies are tramping all the while our friends of the eighth massachusetts are quartered under the dome and cheer us whenever we pass desks marked john covode john cochran and anson burlingame have allowed me to use them as i wrote end of article one part two Article two, part one of Theodore Winthrop, a Civil War Narrative Aborted by Death by Theodore Winthrop. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Article two, Washington as a Camp, part one. Our Barracks at the Capitol. We marched up the hill, and when the dust opened, there was our big tent ready pitched it was an enormous tent the sibley pattern modified a simple soul in our ranks looked up and said tent canvas i don't see it 
that's marble whereupon a simpler soul informed us boys that's the capital and so it was the capital as glad to see the new york seventh regiment as they to see it the capital was to be our quarters and i was pleased to notice that the top of the dome had been left off for ventilation the seventh had had a wearisome and anxious progress from new york as i have chronicled in the june atlantic we had marched from annapolis while rumors to right of us rumors to the left of us volleyed and thundered we had not expected that the attack upon us would be merely verbal the truculent citizens of maryland notified us that we were to find every barn a concord and every hedge a lexington our southern brethren at present repudiate their debts but we fancied that they would keep their warlike promises at least everybody thought they will fire over our heads or bang blank cartridges at us every nose was sniffing for the smell of gunpowder vapor instead of valor nobody looked for so the march had been on the qui vive we were happy enough that it was over and successful successful because mumbo jumbo was not installed in the white house it is safe to call jeff davis mumbo jumbo now but there is no doubt that the luckless man had visions of himself receiving guests repudiating debts and distributing embassies in washington may first eighteen sixty one and as to la davis there seems to be documentary evidence that she meant to be at home in the capital bringing the first strawberries with her from montgomery for her may-day soiree bah one does not like to sneer at people who have their necks in the halter but one happy result of this disturbance is that the disturbers have sent themselves to coventry the lincoln party may be wanting in finish finish comes with use a little roughness of manner the genuine simplicity of a true soul like lincoln is attractive but what man of breeding could ever stand the type southern senator but let him rest in such peace as he can find he and his peers will not soon be seen where we of the new york seventh were now entering they gave us the representatives chamber for quarters without running the gauntlet of caucus primary and election every one of us attained that sacred shrine in we marched tramp tramp bayonets took the place of buncombe the frowsy creatures in ill-made dress coats shimmering satin waistcoats and hats of the tile model who lounge spit and vociferate there and name themselves m c were off our neat uniforms and bright barrels showed to great advantage compared with the usual costumes of the usual dramatis personae of the scene it was dramatic business our entrance there the new chamber is gorgeous but ineffective its ceiling is flat and panelled with transparencies each panel is the coat of arms of a state painted on glass i could not see that the impartial sunbeams tempered by this skylight had burned away the insignia of the malcontent states nor had any rampant secessionist thought to punch any of the seven lost pleiads out from that firmament with a long pole crimson and gold are the prevailing hues of the decorations there is no unity and breadth of colouring the desks of the members radiate in double files from a white marble tribune at the centre of the semicircle in came the new actors on this scene our presence here was the inevitable sequel of past events we appeared with bayonets and bullets because of the bosh uttered on this floor because of the bills with treasonable stump speeches in their bellies passed here because of the cowardice of the poltroons the imbecility of the dodgers and the arrogance of the bullies who had here cooperated to blind and corrupt the minds of the people talk had made a miserable mess of it the ultima ratio was now appealed to some of our companies were marched upstairs into the galleries the sofas were to be their beds with their white cross belts and bright breastplates they made a very picturesque body of spectators for whatever happened in the hall and never failed to applaud in the right or the wrong place at will 
Most of us were bestowed in the amphitheatre. Each desk received its man. He was to scribble on it by day and sleep under it by night. When the desks were all taken, the companies overflowed into the corners and into the lobbies. The staff took committee rooms. The colonel reigned in the speaker's parlor. Once in, firstly, we washed. Such a wash merits a special paragraph. I compliment the MCs, our hosts, upon their water privileges. How we welcomed this chief luxury after our march, and thenceforth how we prized it. For the clean face is an institution which requires perpetual renovation at Washington. Constant vigilance is the price of neatness. When the sky here is not traveling earthward in rain, earth is mounting skyward in dust so much dirt must have an immoral effect after the wash we showed ourselves to the eyes of washington marching by companies each to a different hotel to dinner this became one of the ceremonies of our barrack life we liked it the washingtonians were amused and encouraged by it three times a day with marked punctuality our lines formed and tramped down the hill to scuffle with awkward squads of waders for fare more or less tolerable in these little marches we encountered by and by the other regiments and most soldierly of all the rhode island men in blue flannel blouses and bersaglieria hats but of them hereafter it was a most attractive post of ours at the capital spring was at its freshest and fairest every day was more exquisite than its forerunner we drilled morning noon and evening almost hourly in the pretty square east of the building old soldiers found that they rattled through the manual twice as alert as ever before recruits became old soldiers in a trice and as to awkward squads men that would have been the veriest louts and lubbers in the piping times of peace now learned to toe the mark to whisk their eyes right and their eyes left to drop the butts of their muskets without crushing their corns and all the mysteries of flank and file and so became full-fledged heroes before they knew it in the rests between our drills we lay under the young shade on the sweet young grass with the odors of snowballs and horse-chestnut blooms drifting to us with every whiff of breeze and amused ourselves with watching the evolutions of our friends of the massachusetts eighth and other less experienced soldiers as they appeared upon the field they too like ourselves were going through the transformations these sturdy fellows were then in a rough enough chrysalis of uniform that shed they would look worthy of themselves but the best of the entertainment was within the capital some three thousand or more of us were now quartered there the massachusetts eighth were under the dome no fear of want of air for them the massachusetts sixth were eloquent for their state in the senate chamber it was singularly fitting among the many coincidences in the history of this regiment that they should be there tacitly avenging the assault upon sumner and the attempts to bully the impregnable wilson in the recesses caves and crypts of the capital what other legions were bestowed i do not know i daily lost myself and sometimes when out of my reckoning was put on the way by sentries of strange corps a reading light infantryman or some other we all fraternized there was a fine enthusiasm among us not the soldierly rivalry and discipline that may grow up in future between men of different states acting together but the brotherhood of ardent fellows first in the field and earnest in the cause all our life in the capital was most dramatic and sensational before it was fairly light in the dim interior of the representative's chamber the reveilles of the different regiments came rattling through the corridors every snorer's trumpet suddenly paused the impressive sound of the hushed breathing of a thousand sleepers marking off the fleet moments of the night gave way to a most vociferous uproar the boy element is large in the seventh regiment 
its slang dictionary is peculiar and unabridged as soon as we woke the pit began to chaff the galleries and the galleries the pit we were allowed noise nearly ad libitum our riotous tendencies if they existed escaped by the safety valve of the larynx we joked we shouted we sang we mounted the speaker's desk and made speeches always to the point for if any but a wit ventured to give tongue he was coughed down without ceremony let the m c s adopt this plan and silence their dunces with all our jollity we preserved very tolerable decorum the regiment is assez bien composé many of its privates are distinctly gentlemen of breeding and character the tone is mainly good and the esprit de corps high if the colonel should say up boys and at em i know that the seventh would do brilliantly in the field i speak now of its behaviour indoors this certainly did it credit our thousand did the capital little harm that a corporal's guard of biddies with mops and tubs could not repair in a forenoon's campaign perhaps we should have served our country better by a little vandalism the decorations of the capital have a slight flavour of the southwestern steamboat saloon the pictures now by the way carefully covered would most of them be the better if the figures were bayoneted and the backgrounds sabred out both pictures and decorations belong to that bygone epoch of our country when men shaved the moustache dressed like parsons said sir and chewed tobacco a transition epoch now become an historic blank the home correspondence of our legion of young heroes was illimitable every one had his little tale of active service to relate a decimation of the regiment more or less had profited by the tender moment of departure to pop the question and to receive the dulcet yes these lucky fellows were of course writing to dulcinea regularly three meals of love a day mr van wyck m c and a brace of colleagues were kept hard at work all day giving franks and saving three pennies to the ardent scribes uncle sam lost certainly three thousand cents a day in this manner what crypts and dens caves and cellars there are under that great structure and barrels of flour in every one of them this month of may eighteen sixty one do civilians eat in this proportion or does long standing in the position of a soldier vide tactics for a view of that graceful pose increase a man's capacity for bread and beef so enormously it was infinitely picturesque in these dim vaults by night sentries were posted at every turn their guns gleamed in the gaslight sleepers were lying in their blankets wherever the stones were softest then in the guard-room the guard were waiting their turn we have not had much of this scenery in america and the physiognomy of volunteer military life is quite distinct from anything one sees in european service the people have never had occasion until now to occupy their palace with armed men the following is the oath we were to be sworn into the service of the united states the afternoon of april twenty sixth all the seventh raw men and ripe men marched out into the sweet spring sunshine every fellow had whitened his belts burnished his arms curled his moustache and was scowling his manliest for uncle sam's approval we were drawn up by companies in the capitol square for mustering in presently before us appeared a gorgeous officer in full fig major mcdowell somebody whispered as we presented arms he is a general or perhaps a field marshal now promotions come with a hop skip and jump in these times when demerit resigns and merit stands ready to step to the front major colonel general mcdowell in a soldierly voice now called the roll and we all answered here in voices more or less soldierly he entertained himself with this ceremony for an hour the roll over we were marched and formed in three sides of a square along the turf again the handsome officer stepped forward and recited to us the conditions of our service 
in accordance with a special arrangement made with the governor of new york says the major you are now mustered into the service of the united states to serve for thirty days unless sooner discharged and continues he the oath will now be read to you by the magistrate hereupon a gentleman on mufti but wearing a military cap with an oilskin cover was revealed until now he had seemed an impassive supernumerary but he was biding his time and with due respect be it said saving his wind and now in a stentorian voice he ejaculated the following is the oath per se this remark was not comic but there was something in the dignitary's manner which tickled the regiment as one man the thousand smiled and immediately adopted this new epigram among its private countersigns but the good-natured smile passed away as we listened to the impressive oath following its title we raised our right hands and clause by clause repeated the solemn obligation in the name of god to be faithful soldiers of our country it was not quite so comprehensive as the beautiful knightly pledge administered by king arthur to his comrades and transmitted to our time by major general tennyson of the parnassus division we did not swear as they did of yore to be true lovers as well as loyal soldiers ça va sans dire in eighteen sixty one particularly when you were engaged to your amanda the evening before you started as was the case with many a stalwart brave and many a mighty man of a corporal or sergeant in our ranks we were thrilled and solemnized by the stately ceremony of the oath this again was most dramatic a grand public recognition of a duty a re-avowal of the fundamental belief that our system was worthy of the support and our government of the confidence of all loyal men and there was danger in the middle distance of our view into the future danger of attack or dangerous duty of advance just enough to keep any trifler from feeling that his pledge was mere holiday business so under the cloudless blue sky we echoed in unison the sentences of the oath a little low murmur of rattling arms shaken with the hearty utterance made itself heard in the pauses then the band crashed in magnificently we were now miserable mercenaries serving for low pay and rough rations read the southern papers and you will see us described mud sills that is i believe is the technical word by repeating a form of words after a gentleman in a glazed cap and black raiment we had suffered change into base assassins the off-scouring of society starving for want of employment and willing to imbue our coarse fists in fraternal blood for the sum of eleven dollars a month besides hardtack salt junk and the hope of a confederate states bond apiece for bounty or free loot in the treasuries of florida mississippi and arkansas after the war how carefully from that day we watched the rise and fall of united states stocks if they should go low among the nineties we felt that our eleven dollars per mensum would be imperiled we stayed in our palace for a week or so after april twenty sixth the day of the oath that was the most original part of our duty thus far new york never had so unanimous a deputation on the floor of the representative chamber before and never a more patriotic one take care gentlemen members of congress look to your words and your acts honestly and wisely in future don't palter with liberty again it is not well that soldiers should get into the habit of thinking they are always to unravel the snarls and cut the knots twisted and tied by clumsy or crafty fingers the traitor states already need the main de feu yes and without the gant de valeur let us be aware and keep ourselves worthy of the boon of self-government man by man i do not wish to hear order arms and charge bayonets in the capital but this present defence of free speech and free thought ends let us hope that danger forever 
when we had been ten days in our showy barracks we began to quarrel with luxury what had private soldiers to do with the desks of lawgivers why should we be allowed to revel longer in the dining-rooms of washington hotels partaking the admirable dainties there the may sunshine the birds and the breezes of may invited us to camp the genuine thing under canvas besides uncle sam and abe wanted our room for other company washington was filling up fast with uniforms it seemed as if all the able-bodied men in the country were moving on the first of may with all their property on their backs to agreeable but dusty lodgings on the potomac we also made our may move one afternoon my company the ninth and the engineers the tenth were detailed to follow captain villet and lay out a camp on meridian hill camp cameron as we had the first choice we got on the whole the best site for a camp we occupy the villa and farm of dr stone two miles due north of willard's hotel i assume that hotel as a peculiarly american point of departure and also because it is the hub of washington the centre of an eccentric having the white house at the end of its shorter and the capital at the end of its longer radius moral so they say as well as geometrical sundry dignitaries presidents and what not have lived here in times gone by whoever chose the site ought to be kindly remembered for his good taste the house stands upon the pretty terrace commanding the plain of washington from the upper windows we can see the potomac opening southward like a lake and between us and the water ambitious washington stretching itself along and along like the shackley files of an army of recruits oaks love the soil of this terrace there are some noble ones on the undulations before the house it may be permitted even for one who is supposed to think of nothing but powder and ball to notice one of these grand trees let the ivy-covered stem of the big oak of camp cameron take its place in literature and now enough of scenery the landscape will stay but the troops will not there are trees and slopes of greensward everywhere and shrubbery begins to blossom in these bright days of may before a thousand pretty homes the tents and the tent life are more interesting for the moment than objects which cannot decamp the old villa serves us for headquarters it is a respectable place not without its pretensions four granite pillars as true grit as if the two presidents adams had lugged them on their shoulders all the way from quincy massachusetts make a carriage porch here is the colonel in the big west parlor the quartermaster and commissary in the rooms with sliding doors on the east the hospital upstairs and so on other rooms numerous as the cells in a monastery serve as quarters for the engineer company these dens are not monastic in aspect the house is of course a certosa so far as the gentler sex are concerned but no anchorites dwell here at present if the seventh disdained everything but soldiers fare which it does not common civility would require that it should do violence to its disinclination for comfort and luxury and consume the stores sent down by ardent patriots in new york the cellars of the villa overflow with edibles and in the greenhouse is a most appetizing array of barrels boxes cans and bottles shipped here that our sybarites might not sigh for the flesh pots of home such trash may do very well to amuse the palate in these times of half peace half hostility but when war which for a space does fail shall doubly thundering swell the gale then every soldier should drop gracefully to the simple ration and cease to dabble with frying-pans cooks to their aprons and soldiers to their guns our tents are pitched on a level clover field sloping to the front of our parade ground we use the old wall tent without a fly it is necessary to live in one of these a while to know the vast superiority of the sibley pattern sibley's tent is a wrinkle taken from savage life 
it is the sioux buffalo skin lodge or teepee improved a cone truncated at the top and fitted with a movable apex for ventilation a single tent pole supported upon a hinged tripod of iron sustains the structure it is a compactor more commodious healthier and handsomer than the ancient models none other should be used in permanent encampments for marching troops the french tent de brie is a capital shelter still our fellows manage to be at home as they are some of our model tents are types of the best style of temporary cottages young housekeepers of limited incomes would do well to visit and take heed a whole elysium of household comfort can be had out of a teapot tin a brace of cups tin a brace of plates tin and a frying pan in these days of war everybody can see a camp every one who stays at home has a brother or a son or a lover quartered in one of the myriad tents that have blossomed with the daffodil season all over our green fields of the north i need not then describe our encampment in detail its guard tent in advance its guns in battery its flagstaff its companies quartered in streets with droll and fanciful names its officers tents in the rear at right angles to the lines of company tents its kitchens armed with captain villet's capital army cooking stoves its big marquees the white house and fort pickens for the lodging and messing of the new artillery company its barber shops its offices the same more or less well arranged can be seen in all the rendezvous where the armies are now assembling instead of such description then let me give the log of a single day at our camp end of article two part one article two of theodore winthrop a civil war narrative aborted by death by theodore winthrop this librivox recording is in the public domain article two washington as a camp part two journal of a day at camp cameron by private w company i boom i would rather not believe it but it is yes it is the morning gun uttering its surly hello to sunrise yes and to confirm my suspicions here rattle in the drums and pipe in the fifes wooing us to get up get up with music too peremptory to be harmonious i rise up sur mon seant and glance about me i private w chance by reason of sundry chances to be a member of a company recently largely recruited and bestowed altogether in a big marquee as i lift myself up i see others lift themselves up on those straw bags we kindly call our mattresses the tallest man of the regiment sergeant k is on one side of me on the other side i am separated from two of the fattest men of the regiment by sergeant m another excellent fellow prime cook and prime forager we are all presently on our pins k on whose lengthy continuations of his and the two stout gentlemen on their stout supporters the deep sleepers are pulled up from those abysses of slumber where they had been choking gurgling strangling death-rattling all night there is for a moment a sound of legs rushing into pantaloons and arms plunging into jackets then as the drums and fifes whine and clatter their last notes at the flap of our tent appears our orderly and fierce in the morning sunshine gleams his moustache one month's growth this blessed day fall in for roll call he cries in a ringing voice the orderly can speak sharp if need be we obey not walk in march in stand in is the order but fall in as sleepy men must then the orderly calls off our hundred there are several boyish voices which reply several comic voices a few mean voices and some so earnest and manly and alert that one says to himself 
those are the men for me when work is to be done i read the character of my comrades every morning in each fellow's monosyllable here when the orderly is satisfied that not one of us has run away and accepted a colonelcy from the confederate states since last roll call he notifies those unfortunates who are to be on guard for the next twenty-four hours of the honor and responsibility placed upon their shoulders next he tells us what are to be the drills of the day then right face dismissed break ranks march with ardor we instantly seize tin basins soap and towels and invade a lovely oak grove at the rear and left of our camp here is a delicious spring into which we have fitted a pump the sylvan scene becomes peopled with national guards washing a scene meriting the notice of art as much as any diana and her nymphs but we have no poussin to paint us in the dewy sunlit grove few of us indeed know how picturesque we are at all times and seasons after this beau ideal of a morning toilet comes the antiprandial drill lieutenant w arrives and gives us a little appetizing exercise in carry arms support arms by the right flank march double quick breakfast follows my company messes somewhat helter-skelter in a big tent we have very tolerable rations sometimes luxuries appear of potted meats and hermetical vegetables sent us by the fond new yorkers each little knot of fellows too cooks something savory our table furniture is not elegant our plates are tin there is no silver in our forks but a la guerre comme a la guerre let the scrubs growl lucky fellows if they suffer no worse hardships than this by and by after breakfast come company drills bayonet practice battalion drills and the heavy work of the day our handsome colonel on a nice black nag manoeuvres his thousand men of the line companies on the parade for two or three hours two thousand legs step off accurately together two thousand pipe-clayed cross-belts whitened with infinite pains and waste of time and offering a most inviting target to a foe restrain the beating bosoms of a thousand braves as they the braves not the belts go through the most intricate evolutions unerringly watching these battalion movements private w perhaps goes off and inscribes in his journal any clever prompt man with a mechanical turn an eye for distance a notion of time and a voice of command can be a tactician it is pure pedantry to claim that the manoeuvring of troops is difficult it is not difficult if the troops are quick and steady but to be a general with patience and purpose and initiative ah thinks private w for that you must have the man of genius and already in this war he begins to appear out of massachusetts and elsewhere private w avows without fear that about noon at camp cameron he takes a hearty dinner and with satisfaction private w has had his feasts in cot and chateau in old world and new it is the conviction of said private that nowhere and no when has he expected his ration with more interest and remembered it with more affection than here in the middle hours of the day it is in order to get a pass to go to washington or to visit some of the camps which now in the middle of may began to form a cordon around the city some of these i may criticize before the end of this paper our capital seems arranged by nature to be protected by fortified camps on the circuit of its hills it may be made almost a verona if need be our brother regiments have posts nearly as charming as our own in these fair groves and on these fair slopes on either side of us in the afternoon comes target practice skirmishing drill more company or recruit drill and at half past five our evening parade let me not forget tent inspection at four by the officer of the day when our band plays deliciously at evening parade all washington appears a regiment of ladies rather indisposed to beauty observe us 
sometimes the dons arrive secretaries of state of war of navy or military dons bestriding prancing steeds but bestriding them as if twas not their habit often of an afternoon all which the bad teeth pallid skins and rustic toilettes of the fair and the very moderate horsemanship of the brave privates standing at ease in the ranks take note of not cynically but as men of the world wondrous gymnasts are some of the seventh and after evening parade they often give exhibitions of their prowess to circles of admirers muscle has not gone out nor nerve nor activity if these athletes are to be taken as the types or even as the leaders of the young city-bred men of our time all the feats of strength and grace of the gymnasiums are to be seen here and show to double advantage in the open air then comes sweet evening the moon rises it seems always full moon at camp cameron every tent becomes a little illuminated pyramid cooking fires burn bright along the alleys the boys lark sing shout do all those merry things that make the entertainment of volunteer services the gentle moon looks on mild and amused the fairest lady of all that visit us at last when the songs have been sung and the hundred rumours of the day discussed at ten the intrusive drums and scolding fifes get together and stir up a concert always premature called tattoo the seventh regiment begins to peel for bed at all events private w does for said w takes when he can precious good care of his cuticle and never yields to the lazy and unwholesome habit of soldiers sleeping in the clothes at taps half past ten out go the lights if they do not presently comes the sentry's peremptory command to put them out then and until the dawn of another day a cordon of snorers inside of a cordon of sentries surrounds our national capital the outer cordon sounds its all's well and the inner cordon slumbering echoes it and that is the history of any day at camp cameron it is monotonous it is not monotonous it is laborious it is lazy it is a bore it is a lark it is half war half peace and totally attractive and not to be dispensed with from one's experience in the nineteenth century our advance into virginia meantime the weeks went on may twenty third arrived lovely creatures with their taper fingers had been brewing a flag for us shall i say that its red stripes were celestial rosy as their cheeks its white stripes virgin white as their brows its blue fields cerulean as their eyes and its stars scintillating as the beams of the said peepers shall i say this if i were a poet like jeff davis and each and every editor of each and every newspaper in our misbehaving states i might say it and involuntarily i have said it so the young ladies of new york including i hope her who made my sandwiches for the march hither had been making us a flag as they have made us havelocks pots of jelly bundles of lint flannel dressing gowns embroidered slippers for a rainy day in camp and other necessaries of the soldier's life may twenty third was the day we were to get this sweet symbol of good will at evening parade appeared general thomas as the agent of the ladies the donors with a neat speech on a clean sheet of paper he read it with feeling and private w who has his sentimental moments avows that he was touched by the general's earnest manner and patriotic words our colonel responded with his neat speech very apropos the regiment then made its neat speech nine cheers and a roar of tigers very brief and pointed there had been a note of preparation in general thomas's remark a virginia cave canem and before parade was dismissed we saw our officers holding parley with the colonel something in the wind as i was strolling off to see the sunset and the ladies on parade i began to hear great irrepressible cheers 
bursting from the streets of the different companies orders to be ready to march at a moment's notice so i learned presently from dozens of overjoyed fellows harper's ferry says one alexandria shouts a second richmond only richmond will content a third and some could hardly be satisfied short of the hope of a breakfast in montgomery what a happy thousand were the line companies how their suppressed ardors stirred no want of fight in these lads they may be rather luxurious in their habits for camp life they may be a little impatient of restraint they may have as the type regiment of militia the type faults of militia on service but a desire to dodge a fight is not one of these faults every man in camp was merry except two hundred who were grim these were the two artillery companies ordered to remain in guard of our camp they swore as if camp cameron were flanders i by rights belong to these malcontent and objurgating gentlemen but a chronicler has privilege and i got leave to count myself into the eighth company my old friend captain shumways we were to move about midnight in light marching order with one day's rations it has been always full moon at our camp this night was full moon at its fullest a night more perfect than all perfection mild dewy refulgent at one o'clock the drum beat we fell into ranks and marched quietly off through the shadowy trees of the lane into the highway across the long bridge i have heretofore been proud of my individuality and resisted so far as any one may all the world's attempts to merge me in the mass in pluribus unum has been my motto but whenever i march with the regiment my pride is that i lose my individuality that i am merged that i become a part of a machine a mere walking gentleman a number one or a number two front rank or rear rank file leader or file closer the machine is so steady and so mighty it moves with such musical cadence and such brilliant show that i enjoy it entirely as the unum and lose myself gladly as a pluribus night increases this fascination the outer world is vague in the moonlight objects out of our ranks are lost i see only glimmering steel and glittering buttons and the light-stepping forms of my comrades our array and our step connect us we move as one man a man made up of a thousand members and each member a man is a grand creature particularly when you consider that he is self-made and the object of this self-made giant men-man is to destroy another like himself or the separate pygmy members of another such giant we have failed to put ourselves heads arms legs and wills together as a unit for any purpose so thoroughly as to snuff out a similar unit up to eighteen sixty one it seems that the business of war compacts men best well the seventh a compact projectile was now flinging itself along the road to washington just a month ago in such a night as this we made our first promenade through the enemy's country the moon of annapolis why should we not have our ominous moon as those other fellows had their son of austerlitz the moon of annapolis shone over us no epithets are too fine or too complimentary for such a luminary and there was no dust under her rays so we pegged along to washington and across washington which at that point consists of willard's hotel few other buildings being in sight a hag and a nightcap reviewed us from an upper window as we tramped by opposite that bald block the washington monument and opposite what was of more importance to us a drove of beeves putting beef on their bones in the seedy grounds of the smithsonian institution we were halted while the new jersey brigade some three thousand of them trudged by receiving the complimentary fire of our line as they passed new jersey is not so far from new york but that the dialects of the two can understand each other their respective slangs though peculiar 
are of the same genus. By the end of this war, I trust that these distinctions of locality will be quite annulled. We began to feel like an army, as these thousands thronged by us. There was evidently a movement in force. We rested an hour or more by the road. Mounted officers galloping along down the lines kept up the excitement. At last we had the word to fall in again and march. It is part of the simple perfection of the machine, a regiment, that though it drops to pieces for a rest, it comes together instantly for a start, and nobody is confused or delayed. We moved half a mile farther, and presently a broad pathway of reflected moonlight shone up at us from the Potomac. No orders at this came from the colonel. Attention, battalion, be sentimental. Perhaps privates have no right to perceive the beautiful, but the sections in my neighborhood murmured admiration. The utter serenity of the night was most impressive. Cool and quiet and tender, the moon shone upon our ranks. She does not change her visage, whether it be lovers or burglars or soldiers who use her as a lantern to their feet. The long bridge thus far has been merely a shabby causeway with waterways and draws. Shabby, let me here pause to say that in Virginia shabbiness is the grand universal law, and neatness the spasmodic exception, attained in rare spots, an aeon beyond their old dominion's age. The long bridge has thus far been a totally unhistoric and prosaic bridge roads and bridges are making themselves of importance and shining up into sudden renown in these times the long bridge has done nothing hitherto except carry passengers on its back across the potomac hucksters planters dry goods drummers members of congress et ea genera omnia have here gone and come on their several mercenary errands and as it now appears some sour little imp the very reverse of a sweet little cherub took toll of every man as he passed a heavy toll namely every man's whole store of patriotism and loyalty every man so it seems who passed the long bridge was stripped of his last dollar of amor patriae and came to washington or went home with a waistcoat pocket full of bogus in change it was our business now to open the bridge and see it clear and leave sentries along to keep it permanently free for freedom there is a mile of this long bridge we seem to occupy the whole length of it with our files opened to diffuse the weight of our column we were not now the tired and sleepy squad which just a moon ago had trudged along the railroad to the annapolis junction looking up a capital and a government perhaps lost by the time we touched ground across the bridge dawn was breaking a good omen for poor old sleepy virginia the moon as bright and handsome as a new twenty-dollar piece carried herself straight before us a splendid oriflamme lucky is the private who marches with this van it may be the post of more danger but it is also the post of less dust my throat therefore and my eyes and beard wore the less southern soil when we halted half a mile beyond the bridge and let sunrise overtake us nothing men can do except picnics with ladies in straw flats with feathers is so picturesque as soldiering as soon as the seventh halt anywhere or move anywhere or camp anywhere they resolve themselves into a grand tableau their own ranks should supply their own horace burnett our groups were never more entertaining than at this halt by the roadside on the alexandria road stacks of guns make a capital framework for drapery and red blankets dot in the lights most artistically the fellows lined the road with their gay array asleep on the rampage on the lounge and nibbling at their rations by and by when my brain had taken in as much of the picturesque as it could stand it suffered the brief congestion known as a nap i was suddenly awaked by the rattle of a horse's hoofs 
Before I had rubbed my eyes, the writer was gone. His sharp tidings had stayed behind him. Ellsworth was dead, so he said hurriedly, and rode on. Poor Ellsworth, a fellow of genius and initiative. He had still so much of the boy in him that he rattled forward boyishly, and so died. See Monumentum Requiris. Look at his regiment. It was a brilliant stroke to levy it, and if it does worthily, its young colonel will not have lived in vain. As the morning hours passed, we learned that we were the rear guard of the left wing of the army advancing into Virginia. The seventh, as the best organized body, acted as reserve to this force. It didn't wish to be in the rear, but such is the penalty of being reliable for an emergency. Fellow soldier, be a scalawag, be a bashy bazooki, be a Billy Wilsoneer, if you wish to see the fun in the van. When the road grew too hot for us, on account of the fire of sunshine in our rear, we jumped over the fence into the race course, a big field beside us, and there became squatter sovereigns all day. I shall be a bore if I say again what a pretty figure we cut in this military picnic, with two long lines of blankets draped on bayonets for parasols. The New Jersey Brigade were meanwhile doing worky work on the ridge just behind us. The road and railroad to Alexandria follow the general course of the river southward along the level. This ridge to be fortified is at the point where the highway bends from west to south. The works were intended to serve as an advance tête du pont, a bridgehead with a very long neck connecting it with the bridge. That fine old Fabius, General Scott, had no idea of flinging an army out broadcast into Virginia, and in the insupposable case that it turned tail, leaving it no defended passage to run away by. This was my first view of a field work in construction, also my first hand as a laborer at a field work. I knew glacis and counterscarp on paper also on paper superior slope banquette and the other dirty parts of a redoubt here they were not on paper a slight wooden scaffolding determined the shape of the simple work and when i arrived a thousand jerseymen were working not at all like jerseymen with picks spades and shovels cutting into virginia digging into virginia shoveling up virginia for virginia's protection against pseudo virginians I swarmed in for a little while with our paymaster, picked a little, spaded a little, shoveled a little, took a hand to my great satisfaction at earthworks, and for my efforts I venture to suggest that Jersey City owes me its freedom in a box, and Jersey State a basket of its finest clicquot. Is my gentle reader tired of the short marches and frequent halts of the seventh? Remember, gentle reader, that you must be schooled by such alphabetical exercises to spell bigger words, skirmish, battle, defeat, rout, massacre, by and by. Well, to be xenophontic, from the race course that evening we marched one stadium, one parasang, to a cedar grove up the road in the grove is a spring worthy to be called a fountain and what i determined by infallible indications to be a lager beer saloon saloon no more war is no respecter of localities be it arlington house the seedy palace of a virginia dawn be it the humbler but seedy pavilion where the tired teuton watches the dust of washington away from his tonsils each must surrender to the bold soldier boy. Exit champagne and its goblet, exit lager and its mug, enter whiskey and water in a tin pot. Such are the horrors of civil war. And now I must cut short my story, for graver matters press. As to the residence of the seventh in the cedar grove for two days and two nights, how they endured the hardship of a bivouac on soft earth and the starvation of coffee sans milk, how they digged manfully in the trenches by gangs 
all these two laborious days with what supreme artistic finish their work was achieved how they chopped off their corns with axes as they cleared the brushwood from the glacis how they blistered their hands how they chaffed that they were not lunging with battalious steel at the breasts of the minions of the oligarchs how washington seeing the smoke of burning rubbish and hearing dropping shots of target practice or of novices with the musket shooting each other by accident how washington alarmed imagined a battle and went into panic accordingly all this is it not written in the daily papers on the evening of the twenty sixth the seventh travelled back to camp cameron in a smart shower its service was over its month was expired the troops ordered to relieve it had arrived it had given the other volunteers the benefit of a month's education at its drills and parades it had enriched poor washington to the tune of fifty thousand dollars ah washington that we under providence and after general butler saved from the heel of succession ah washington why did you charge us so much for our milk and butter and strawberries the seventh then after a month of delightful duty was to be mustered out of service and take new measures if it would to have a longer and a larger share in the war arlington heights i took advantage of the day of rest after our return to have a gallop about the outposts arlington heights had been the spot whence the alarmists threatened us daily with big thunder and bursting bombs i was curious to see the region that had had washington under its thumb so private w tired of his foot soldiering got a quadruped under him and felt like a cavalier again the horse took me along the towpath of the cumberland canal as far as the redoubts where we had worked our task then i turned up the hill took a look at the camp of the new york twenty fifth at the left and rode along for arlington house grand name and the domain is really quite grand but ill-kept fine oaks make beauty without asking favors fine oaks and a fair view make all the beauty of arlington it seems that this old establishment like many another old virginian had claimed its respectability for its antiquity and failed to keep up to the level of the times the road winds along through the trees climbing to fairer and fairer reaches of view over the plain of washington i had not fancied that there was any such lovely sight near the capital but we have not yet appreciated what nature has done for us here when civilization once makes up its mind to colonize washington all this amphitheatre of hills will blossom with structures of the sublimest gingerbread arlington house is the antipodes of gingerbread except that it is yellow and disposed to crumble it has a pompous propylon of enormous stuccoed columns any house smaller than blenheim would tail on insignificantly after such a frontispiece the interior has a certain careless romantic decayed gentleman effect wholly virginian it was enlivened by the uniforms of staff officers just now and as they rode through the trees of the approach and by the tents of the new york eighth encamped in the grove to the rear the tableau was brilliantly warlike here by the way let me pause to ask as a horseman though a foot soldier why generals and other gorgeous fellows make such guise of their horses with trappings if the horse is a screw cover him thick with saddle claws girths cruppers breastbands and as much brass and tinsel as your pay will enable you to buy but if not a screw let his fair proportions be seen as much as may be and don't bother a lover of good horseflesh to eliminate so much uniform before he can see what is beneath from arlington i rode to the other encampments the sixty ninth fifth and twenty eighth all of new york and heard their several stories of alarms and adventures this completed the circuit of the new fortifications of the great camp washington was now a fortress the capital was out of danger and therefore of no further interest to anybody 
the time had come for myself and my regiment to leave it by different ways partant pour la syrie i should have been glad to stay and see my comrades through to their departure but there was a massachusetts man down at fortress monroe butler by name has any one heard of him and to this gentleman it chanced that i was to report myself so i packed my knapsack got my furlough shook hands with my fellows said good-bye to camp cameron and was off two days after our month's service was done farewell to the seventh under providence washington owes its safety first to general butler whose genius devised the circumvention of baltimore and its rascal rout and whose utter bravery executed the plan he is the grand yankee of this little period of the war second to the other most worshipful grand yankees of the massachusetts regiment who followed their leader as he knew they would discovered a forgotten colony called annapolis and dashed in there asking no questions third and while i gladly yield the first places to this general and his men i put the seventh in as last but not least in saving the capital character always tells the seventh by good hard faithful work at drill had established its fame as the most thorough militia regiment in existence its military and moral character were excellent the mere name of the regiment carried weight it took the field as if the field were a ballroom there were myriads eager to march but they had not made ready beforehand yes the seventh had its important share in the rescue without our support whether our leaders tendered it eagerly or hesitatingly general butler's position at annapolis would have been critical and his forced march to the capital a forlorn hope heroic but desperate so honor to whom honor is due here i must cut short my story so good-bye to the seventh and thanks for the fascinating month i have passed in their society in this pause of the war our camp life has been to me as brilliant as a permanent picnic good-bye to company i and all the fine fellows rough and smooth cool old hands and recruits verdant but ardent good-bye to our lieutenants to whom i owe much kindness good-bye the orderly so peremptory on parade so indulgent off good-bye everybody and so in haste i close end of article two part two Article three of Theodore Winthrop, a Civil War Narrative Aborted by Death by Theodore Winthrop. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Article three Obituary Theodore Winthrop Part one Theodore Winthrop's life, like a fire long smouldering, suddenly blazed up into a clear bright flame and vanished those of us who were his friends and neighbors by whose fireside he sat familiarly and of whose life upon the pleasant staten island where he lived was so important a part were so impressed by his intense vitality that his death strikes us with peculiar strangeness like sudden winter silence falling upon these humming fields of june as i look along the wooded brookside by which he used to come i should not be surprised if i saw that knit wiry light figure moving with quick firm leopard tread over the grass the keen gray eyes the mustering fair hair the kind serious smile the mien of undaunted patience if you did not know him you would have found his greeting a little constrained not from shyness but from genuine modesty and the habit of society you would have remarked that he was silent and observant rather than talkative and whatever he said however gay or grave would have had the reserve of sadness about which his whole character was drawn if it were a woman who saw him for the first time she would inevitably see him through a slight cloud of misapprehension for the man and his manner were a little at variance 
the chance is that at the end of five minutes she would have thought him conceited at the end of five months she would have known him as one of the simplest and most truly modest of men and he had the heroic sincerity which belongs to such modesty of a noble ambition and sensitive to applause as every delicate nature veined with genius always is he would not provoke the applause by doing anything which although it lay easily within his power was not yet wholly approved by him as worthy many men are ambitious and full of talent and when the prize does not fairly come they snatch at it unfairly this was precisely what he could not do he would strive and deserve but if the crown were not laid upon his head in the clear light of day and by confession of absolute merit he could ride to his place again and wait looking with no envy but in patient wonder and with critical curiosity upon the victors it is this which he expresses in the paper in the july number of this magazine washington as a camp when he says i have heretofore been proud of my individuality and resisted so far as one may all the world's attempts to merge me in the mass it was this which made many who knew him much but not truly feel that he was purposeless and restless they knew his talent his opportunities why does he not concentrate why does he not bring himself to bear he did not plead his ill health nor would they have allowed the plea the difficulty was deeper he felt that he had shown his credentials and they were not accepted i can wait i can wait was the answer his life made to the impatience of his friends we are all fond of saying that a man of real gifts will fit himself to the work of any time and so he will but it is not necessarily to the first thing that offers there is always latent in civilized society a certain amount of what may be called sir philip sidney genius which will seem elegant and listless and aimless enough until the congenial chance appears a plant may grow in a cellar but it will flower only under the due sun and warmth sir philip sidney was but a lovely possibility until he went to be governor of flushing what else was our friend until he went to the war the age of elizabeth did not monopolize the heroes and they are always essentially the same when for instance i read in a letter of herbert Languitz to sidney you are not over cheerful by nature or when in another he speaks of the portrait that paul veronese painted of sidney and says the painter has represented you sad and thoughtful i can believe that he is speaking of my neighbor or when i remember what sidney wrote to his younger brother being a gentleman born you purpose to furnish yourself with the knowledge of such things as may be serviceable to your country and calling or what he wrote to Languet, our princes are enjoying too deep a slumber i cannot think there is any man possessed of common understanding who does not see to what these rough storms are driving by which all christendom has been agitated now these many years i seem to hear my friend as he used to talk on the sunday evenings when he sat in this huge cane chair at my side in which i saw him last and in which i shall henceforth always see him nor is it unfair to remember just here that he bore one of the few really historic names in this country he never spoke of it but we should all have been very sorry not to feel that he was glad to have sprung straight from that second john winthrop who was the first governor of connecticut the younger sister colony of massachusetts bay the john winthrop who obtained the charter of privilege for his colony how clearly the quality of the man has been transmitted how brightly the old name shines out again he was born in new haven on the twenty second of september eighteen twenty eight and was a grave delicate rather precocious child he was at school only in new haven and entered yale college just as he was sixteen the pure manly morality which was the substance of his character and his brilliant exploits of scholarship 
made him the idol of his college friends, who saw in him the promise of the splendid career which the fond faith of students allots to the favorite classmate. He studied for the Clark scholarship and gained it, and his name, in the order of time, is first upon the roll of that foundation. He won the Townshend Prize for the best composition on history. For the Berkeleyan scholarship he and another were judged equal, and drawing lots the other gained the scholarship, but they divided the honor. In college his favorite studies were Greek and mental philosophy. He never lost the scholarly taste and habit. A wide reader, he retained knowledge with little effort, and often surprised his friends by the variety of his information. Yet it was not strange, for he was born a scholar. His mother was the great-granddaughter of old President Edwards, and among his ancestors upon the maternal side, Winthrop counted seven presidents of Yale. Perhaps also in this learned descent we may find the secret of his early seriousness. Thoughtful and self-criticizing, he was peculiarly sensible to religious influences, under which his criticism easily became self-accusation, and his sensitive seriousness grew sometimes morbid. He would have studied for the ministry or a professorship upon leaving college, except for his failing health. In the later days when I knew him, the feverish ardor of the first religious impulse was past. It had given place to a faith much too deep and sacred to talk about, yet holding him always with serene, steady poise in the purest region of life and feeling. There was no franker or more sympathetic companion for young men of his own age than he, but his conversation fell from his lips as unsullied as his soul. He graduated in 1848 when he was twenty years old, and for the sake of his health, which was seriously shattered, an ill health that colored all his life, he set out upon his travels. He went first to England, spending much time at Oxford, where he made pleasant acquaintances, and walking through Scotland. He then crossed over to France and Germany, exploring Switzerland very thoroughly upon foot once or twice escaping great dangers among the mountains, and pushed on to Italy and Greece, still walking much of the way. In Italy he made the acquaintance of Mr. W. H. Aspinwall of New York, and upon his return became tutor to Mr. Aspinwall's son. He presently accompanied his pupil and a nephew of Mr. Aspinwall, who were going to a school in Switzerland, and after a second short tour of six months in Europe, he returned to New York, and entered Mr. Aspinwall's counting-house. In the employ of the Pacific Steamship Company, he went to Panama, and resided for about two years, traveling and often ill of the fevers of the country. Before his return he traveled through California and Oregon, went to Vancouver's Island, Puget Sound, and the Hudson Bay Company stationed there. At the Dales he was smitten with the smallpox and lay ill for six weeks. He often spoke with the warmest gratitude of the kind care that was taken of him there, but when only partially recovered he plunged off again into the wilderness. At another time he fell very ill upon the plains and lay down as he supposed to die, but after some time struggled up and on again. He returned to the counting-room, but unsated with adventure, joined the disastrous expedition of Lieutenant Strain, during which his health was still more weakened, and he came home again in 1854. In the following year he studied law and was admitted to the bar. In 1856 he entered heartily into the Fremont campaign, and from the strongest conviction. He went into some of the dark districts of Pennsylvania and spoke incessantly. The roving life and its picturesque episodes, with the earnest conviction which inspired him, made the summer and autumn exciting and pleasant. The following year he went to St. Louis to practice law. The climate was unkind to him, and he returned and began the practice in New York. But he could not be a lawyer. His health was too uncertain, and his tastes and ambition allured him elsewhere. 
His mind was brimming with the results of observation. His fancy was alert and inventive, and he wrote tales and novels. At the same time he delighted to haunt the studio of his friend Church, the painter, and watch day by day the progress of his picture, The Heart of the Andes. It so fired his imagination that he wrote a description of it which, as if rivaling the tropical and tangled richness of the picture, he threw together such heaps and masses of gorgeous words that the reader was dazzled and bewildered. The wild campaigning life was always a secret passion with him. His stories of travel were so graphic and warm that I remember one evening, after we had been tracing upon the map a route he had taken, and he had touched the whole region into life with his description, my younger brother, who had sat by and listened with wide eyes all the evening, exclaimed with a sigh of regretful satisfaction, as the door closed upon our storyteller, it's as good as robinson crusoe yet with all his fondness and fitness for that kind of life or indeed any active administrative function his literary ambition seemed to be the deepest and strongest he had always been writing in college and upon his travels he kept diaries and he has left behind him several novels tales sketches of travel and journals the first published writing of his which is well known is his description in the june number of this magazine of the march of the seventh regiment of new york to washington it was charming by its graceful sparkling crisp off-hand dash and ease but it is only the practised hand that can dash off effectively let any other clever member of the clever regiment who has never written try to dash off the story of a day or a week in the life of the regiment and he will see that the writer did that little thing well because he had done large things carefully yet amid all the hurry and brilliant bustle of the articles the author is as he was in the most bustling moment of the life they described a spectator an artist he looks on at himself and the scene of which he is part. He is willing to merge his individuality, but he does not merge it, for he could not. So wandering, hoping, trying, waiting, thirty-two years of his life went by, and they left him true, sympathetic, patient the sharp private griefs that sting the heart so deeply and leave a little poison behind did not spare him but he bore everything so bravely so silently often silent for a whole evening in the midst of pleasant talkers but not impertinently sad nor ever sullen that we all loved him a little more at such times the ill health from which he always suffered and a flower-like delicacy of temperament the yearning desire to be of some service in the world coupled with the curious critical introspection which marks every sensitive and refined nature and paralyzes action overcast his life and manner to the common eye with pensiveness and even sternness he wrote verses in which his heart seems to exhale in a sigh of sadness but he was not in the least a sentimentalist the womanly grace of temperament merely enhanced the unusual manliness of his character and impression it was like a delicate carnation upon the cheek of a robust man for his humour was exuberant he seldom laughed loud but his smile was sweet and appreciative then the range of his sympathies was so large that he enjoyed every kind of life and person and was everywhere at home in walking and riding in skating and running in games out of doors and in no one of us all in the neighborhood was so expert so agile as he for above all things he had what we yankees call faculty the knack of doing everything if he rode with a neighbor who was a good horseman theodore who was a centaur when he mounted would put any horse at any gate or fence for it did not occur to him that he could not do whatever was to be done 
Often, after riding for a few hours in the morning, he stepped out of doors, and from pure love of the fun, leaped and turned somersaults on the grass before going up to town. In walking about the island, he constantly stopped by the roadside fences, and, grasping the highest rail, swung himself swiftly and neatly over and back again, resuming the walk and the talk without delay. I do not wish to make him too much a hero. Death, says Bacon, openeth the gate to good fame. When a neighbor dies, his form and quality appear clearly, as if he had been dead a thousand years. Then we see what we only felt before. Heroes in history seem to us poetic because they are there. But if we should tell the simple truth of some of our neighbors, it would sound like poetry. Winthrop was one of the men who represent the manly and poetic qualities that always exist around us, not great genius, which is ever salient, but the fine fiber of manhood that makes the worth of the race. Closely engaged with his literary employments, and more quiet than ever, he took less active part in the last election. But when the menace of treason became an aggressive act, he saw very clearly the inevitable necessity of arms. We all talked of it constantly, watching the news, chafing at the sad necessity of delay which was sure to confuse foreign opinion and alienate sympathy, as has proved to be the case. As matters advanced and the war cloud rolled up thicker and blacker, he looked at it with the secret satisfaction that war for such a cause opened his career both as thinker and actor. The admirable coolness, the promptness, the cheerful patience, the heroic ardor, the intelligence, the tough experience of campaigning, the profound conviction that the cause was in truth the good old cause which was now to come to the death grapple with its old enemy, justice against injustice, order against anarchy. All these should now have their turn, and the wanderer and waiter settle himself at last. We took a long walk together on the Sunday that brought the news of the capture of Fort Sumter. He was thoroughly alive with a bright, earnest forecast of his part in the coming work. Returning home with me, he sat until late in the evening talking with an unwanted spirit, saying playfully, I remember, that if his friends would only give him a horse, he would ride straight to victory. Especially he wished that some competent person would keep a careful record of events as they passed. For we are making our history, he said, hand over hand. He sat quietly in the great chair while he spoke, and at last rose to go. We went together to the door and stood for a little while upon the piazza, where we had sat peacefully through so many golden summer hours. The last hour for us had come, but we did not know it. We shook hands and he left me, passing rapidly along the brookside under the trees, and so in the soft spring starlight vanished from my sight forever. The next morning came the President's proclamation. Winthrop went immediately to town and enrolled himself in the artillery corps of the 7th Regiment. During the two or three following days he was very busy and very happy. On Friday afternoon, the 19th of April, I stood at the corner of Cortland Street and saw the regiment as it marched away. Two days before I had seen the Massachusetts troops going down the same street. During the day the news had come that they were already engaged, that some were already dead in Baltimore. And the seventh, as they went, blessed and wept over by a great city, went, as we all believed, to terrible battle. The setting sun in a clear April sky shone full up the street. Mother's eyes glistened at the windows upon the glistening bayonets of their boys below. I knew that Winthrop and the other dear friends were there, but I did not see them. I saw only a thousand men marching like one hero. The music beat and rang and clashed in the air. Marching to death or victory or defeat, it mattered not. They marched for justice, 
and god was their captain from that moment he has told his own story in these pages until he went to fortress monroe and was made acting military secretary and aide by general butler before he went he wrote the most copious and gayest letters from the camp he was thoroughly aroused and all his powers happily at play in a letter to me soon after his arrival in washington he says i see no present end to this business we must conquer the south afterwards we must be prepared to do its police in its own behalf and in behalf of its black population whom this war must without precipitation emancipate we must hold the south as the metropolitan police holds new york all this is inevitable now i wish to enroll myself at once in the police of the nation and for life if the nation will take me i do not see that i can put myself experience and character to any more useful use my experience in this short campaign with the seventh assures me that volunteers are for one purpose and regular soldiers entirely another we want regular soldiers for the cause of order in these anarchical countries and we want men in command who though they may be valuable as temporary satraps or proconsuls to make liberty possible where it is now impossible will never under any circumstances be disloyal to liberty will always oppose any scheme of any one to constitute a military government and will be ready when the time comes to imitate washington we must think of these things and prepare for them love to all the dear friends this trip has been all a lark to an old tramper like myself later he writes it is the loveliest day of fullest spring an aspen under the window whispers to me in a chorus of all its leaves and when i look out every leaf turns a sunbeam at me i am writing in Villers quarters in the villa of somebody stone upon whose place or farm we are encamped the man who built and set down these four great granite pillars in front of his house for a carriage porch had an eye or two for a fine sight this seems to be the finest possible about washington it is a terrace called meridian hill two miles north of pennsylvania avenue the house commands the vista of the potomac all the plain of the city and a charming lawn of delicious green with oaks of first dignity just coming into leaf it is lovely nature and the spot has snatched a grace from art the grounds are laid out after a fashion and planted with shrubbery the snowballs are at their snowballiest have you heard or how many times have you used the simile of some one badmus or cadmus or another hero who sowed the dragon's teeth and they came up dragoons a hundredfold and infantry a thousandfold nil admirari is of course my frame of mind but i own astonishment at the crop of soldiers they must ripen a while perhaps before they are to be named quite soldiers ripening takes care of itself and by the harvest time they will be ready to cut down i find that the men best informed about the south do not anticipate much severe fighting scott's fabian policy will demoralize their armies if the people do not bother the great cunitator to death before he is ready to move to assured victory he will make defeat impossible meanwhile there will be enough outwork going on like those neat jobs in missouri to keep us all interested know o oh comrade that i am already a corporal an acting corporal selected by our commanding officer for my general effect of pipe clay my rapidity of heel and toe my present arms etc but liable to be ousted by suffrage any moment quod faustum sit i had already been introduced to the secretary of war i called at blank's and saw with two or three others blank on the sofa him my prophetic soul named my uncle to be but in my uncle's house are many nephews and whether nepotism or my transcendent merit will prevail we shall see 
I have fun, I get experience, I see much, it pays. Ah, yes, but in the fair days of May I miss my Staten Island. War stirs the pulse, but it wounds a little all the time. Compliment for me, Tib, a little dog, and the wisterias, also the mares and the billiard table. Ask blank to give you t'other lump of sugar in my behalf. Should blank return, say that I regret not being present with an unpremeditated compliment as thus, ah, the first rose of summer. I will try to get an enemy's button for blank, should the enemy attack. If the seventh returns presently, I am afraid I shall be obliged to return with them for a time, but I mean to see this job through somehow. In such an airy, sportive vein, he wrote, with the firm purpose and the distinct thought visible under the sparkle. Before the regiment left Washington, as he has recorded, he said good-bye and went down the bay to Fortress Monroe. Of his unshrinking and sprightly industry, his good head, his warm heart, and cool hand as a soldier, General Butler has given precious testimony to his family. I loved him as a brother, the general writes of his young aide. The last days of his life at Fortress Monroe were doubtless also the happiest. His energy and enthusiasm and kind winning ways and the deep satisfaction of feeling that all his gifts could now be used as he would have them showed him and his friends that his day had at length dawned. He was especially interested in the condition and fate of the slaves who escaped from the neighboring region and sought refuge at the fort. He had never for an instant forgotten the secret root of the treason which was desolating the land with war, and in his view there would be no peace until that root was destroyed. In his letters written from the fort, he suggests plans of relief and comfort for the refugees, and one of his last requests was to a lady in New York for clothes for these poor pensioners. They were promptly sent, but reached the fort too late. As I look over these last letters, which gush and throb with the fullness of his activity, and are so tenderly streaked with touches of constant affection and remembrance, yet are so calm and duly mindful of every detail, I do not think with an elder friend, in whom the wisdom of years has only deepened sympathy for all generous youthful impulse, of Virgil's Marcellus, Ue, miserande puer but i recall rather still haunted by philip sidney what he wrote just before his death to his father-in-law walsingham i think a wise and constant man ought never to grieve while he doth play as a man may say his own part truly end of article three part one Article three of Theodore Winthrop, A Civil War Narrative Aborted by Death by Theodore Winthrop. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Article three Obituary Theodore Winthrop Part two. The sketches of the campaign in Virginia, which Winthrop had commenced in this magazine, would have been continued and have formed an invaluable memoir of the places, the men, and the operations of which he was a witness and a part. As a piece of vivid pictorial description, which gives the spirit as well as the spectacle, his Washington as a camp is masterly. He knew not only what to see and to describe, but what to think, so that in his papers you are not at the mercy of a multitudinous mass of facts, but understand their value and relation. Immediately upon his arrival at Fort Monroe, he had commenced a third article, which was to have occupied the place of this. It is inserted here, just as he left it, with one brief addition only to make his known meaning more clear. The part called Voices of the Contraband was written previously and is not paged in the manuscript. 
it was to have been introduced into the article but it is placed first here that the sequence of the paper as far as the author had written it may remain undisturbed voices of the contraband solvonter risu tabulae an epigram abolished slavery in the united states large wisdom stated in fine wit was the decision negroes are contraband of war they are property claim the owners very well as general butler takes contraband horses used in transport of munitions of war so he takes contraband black creatures who tote the powder to the carts and flagellate the steeds as he takes a spade used in hostile earthworks so he goes a little farther off and takes the black muscle that wields the spade as he takes the rations of the foe so he takes the sable soye whose skilful hand makes these rations savory to the palates and digestible by the stomachs of the foe and so puts blood and nerve into them as he took the steam gun so he now takes what might become the stoker of the steam part of that machine and the aimer of its gun part as he takes the musket so he seizes the object who in the virginia army carries that musket on its shoulder until its master is ready to reach out a lazy hand nonchalantly lift the piece and carelessly pop a yankee the third number of winthrop's sketches of the campaign in virginia begins here physiognomy of fortress monroe the adelaide is a steamer plying between baltimore and norfolk but as norfolk has ceased to be a part of the united states and is nowhere the adelaide goes no farther than fortress monroe old point comfort the chief somewhere of this region a lady no doubt adelaide herself appears in alto relievo on the paddle-box she has a short waist long skirt sans crinoline leg of mutton sleeves lofty bearing and stands like ariadne on an island of pedestal size surrounded by two or more pre-raphaelite trees in the offing comes or goes a steamboat also pre-raphaelite and if ariadne adelaide's bacchus is on board he is out of sight at the bar such as adelaide brought me in sight of fortress monroe at sunrise may twenty ninth eighteen sixty one the fort though old enough to be full grown has not grown very tall upon the low sands of old point comfort it is a big house with a basement story and a garret the roof is left off and the stories between basement and garret have never been inserted but why not be technical for basement read a tier of casemates each with a black cyclops of a big gun peering out while above in the open air with not even a parasol over their backs lie the barbette guns staring without a wink over sea and shore in peace with a hundred or so soldiers here and there this vast enclosure might seem a solitude now it is a busy city a city of one idea i seem to recollect that disraeli said somewhere that every great city was founded on one idea and existed to develop it this city into which we have improvised a population has its idea a unit of an idea with two halves the east half is the recovery of norfolk the west half the occupation of richmond and the idea complete is the education of virginia's unmannerly and disloyal sons why secession did not take this place when its defenders numbered a squad of officers and three hundred men is mysterious floyd and his gang were treacherous enough what was it were they imbecile were they timid was there till too late a doubt whether the traitors at home in virginia would sustain them in an overt act of such big overture as an attempt here but they lost the chance and with it lost the key of virginia which general butler now holds this thirtieth day of may and will presently begin to turn in the lock three hundred men to guard a mile and a half of ramparts three hundred to protect some sixty-five broad acres within the walls 
but the place was a thermipylae and there was a fine old leonidas at the head of its three hundred he was enough to make spartans of them colonel dimmock was the man a quiet modest shrewd faithful christian gentleman and he held all virginia at bay the traitors knew that so long as the colonel was here these black muzzles with their white tompions like a black eye with a white pupil meant mischief to him and his guns flanking the approaches and ready to pile the moat full of seceders the country owes the safety of fortress monroe within the walls are sundry nice old brick houses for officers barracks the jolly bachelors live in the casemates and the men in long barracks now not so new or so convenient as they might be in fact the physiognomy of fortress monroe is not so neat well shorn and elegant as a grand military post should be perhaps our floyds and the like thought if they kept everything in perfect order here they as virginians accustomed to general seediness would not find themselves at home but the new regime must change all this and make this the biggest the best equipped and the model garrison of the country for of course this must be strongly held for many many years to come it is idle to suppose that the dull louts we find here not enlightened even enough to know that loyalty is the best policy can be allowed the highest privilege of the moral the intelligent and the progressive self-government mind is said to march fast in our time but mind must put on steam hereabouts to think and act for itself without stern schooling in half a century but no digressing i have looked far away from the physiognomy of the fortress let us turn to the physiognomy of the country the face of this county elizabeth city by name is as flat as a chinaman's i can hardly wonder that the people here have retrograded or rather not advanced this dull flat would make anybody dull and flat i am no longer surprised at john tyler he has had a bare blank brick house entitled sweetly margarita cottage or some such tender epithet at hampton a mile and a half from the fort a summer in this site would make any man a bore and as something has done this favor for his accidency i am willing to attribute it to the influence of locality the country is flat the soil is fine sifted loam running to dust as the air of england runs to fog the woods are dense and beautiful and full of trees unknown to the parallel of new york the roads are miserable cart paths the cattle are scalawags so are the horses not run away so are the people black and white not run away the crops are tolerable where the invaders have not trampled them altogether the whole concern strikes me as a failure captain john smith and company might as well have stayed at home if this is the result of the two hundred and thirty years occupation apparently the colonists picked out a poor spot and the longer they stayed the worse fist they made of it powhatan pocahontas and the others without pantaloons and petticoats were really more serviceable colonists the farmhouses are mostly miserable mean habitations i don't wonder the tenants were glad to make our arrival the excuse for running off here are men claiming to have been worth forty thousand dollars half in biped property half in all other kinds and they lived in dens such as a drayman might have disdained and a hod carrier only accepted on compulsion physiognomy of water always beautiful the sea cannot be spoilt our fleet enlivens it greatly here is the flagship cumberland vis-a-vis -vis the fort off to the left are the prizes unlucky schooners which ought to be carrying pine wood to the kitchens of new york and new potatoes and green peas for the wood to operate upon this region by the way is new york's watermelon patch for early melons and if we do not conquer a piece here pretty soon the jersey fruit will have the market to itself besides stately flagships and poor little gumboat schooners transports are coming and going with regiments or provisions for the same 
here too are old acquaintances from the bay of new york the yankee a lively tug the harriet lane coquettish and plucky the catiline ready to reverse her name and put down conspiracy on the dock are munitions of war in heaps volunteer armies load themselves with things they do not need and forget the essentials the unlucky army quartermaster's people accustomed to the slow and systematic methods of the bygone days at fortress monroe fume terribly over these cargoes the new men and the new manners of the new army do not altogether suit the actual men and manners of the obsolete army the old men and the new must recombine what we want now is the vigor of fresh people to utilize the experience of the experts the silver-gray army needs a frisky element interfused on the other hand the new army needs to be taught a lesson in method by the old and the two combined will make the grand army of civilization the forces when i arrived fort monroe and the neighborhood were occupied by two armies one general butler two about six thousand men here and at newport's news making together more than twelve thousand men of the first army consisting of the general i will not speak let his past supreme services speak for him as i doubt not the future will next to the array of man comes the army of men regulars a few with many post officers among them many very fine and efficient fellows these are within the post also within is the third regiment of massachusetts under colonel wardrop the right kind of man to have and commanding a capital regiment of three months men neatly uniformed in gray with cocked felt hats without the fort across the moat and across the bridge connecting this peninsula of sand with the nearest side of the mainland are encamped three new york regiments each is in a wheat field up to its eyes in dust in order of precedence they come one two and five in order of personal splendor of uniform they come five one two in order of exploits they are all in the same negative position at present and the second has done rather the most robbing of hen roosts the fifth durier zouaves lighten up the woods brilliantly with their scarlet legs and scarlet headpieces these last words were written upon the day that the attack in which winthrop fell was arranged the disastrous day of the tenth of june at great bethel need not be described here it is already written with tears and vain regrets in our history it is useless to prolong the debate as to where the blame of the defeat if blame there were should rest but there is an impression somewhat prevalent that winthrop planned the expedition which is incorrect as military secretary of the commanding general he made a memorandum of the outline of the plan as it had been finally settled precisely what that memorandum which has been published was he explains in the last letter he wrote a few hours before leaving the fort he says if i come back safe i will send you my note of the plan of attack part made up from the general's hints part my own fancies this defines exactly his responsibility his position as aide and military secretary his admirable qualities as adviser under the circumstances and his personal friendship for the general brought him intimately into the council of war he embarked in the plan all the interest of a brave soldier contemplating his first battle he probably made suggestions some of which were adopted the expedition was the first move from fort monroe to which the country had long been looking in expectation these were the reasons why he felt so peculiar a responsibility for its success and after the melancholy events of the earlier part of the day he saw that its fortunes could be retrieved only by a dash of heroic enthusiasm fired himself he sought to kindle others 
for one moment that brave inspiring form is plainly visible to his whole country wrapped and calm standing upon the log nearest the enemy's battery the mark of their sharpshooters the admiration of their leaders waving his sword cheering his fellow-soldiers with his bugle voice of victory young brave beautiful for one moment erect and glowing in the wild whirl of battle the next falling forward toward the foe dead but triumphant on the nineteenth of april he left the armory door of the seventh with his hand upon a howitzer on the twenty first of june his body lay upon the same howitzer at the same door wrapped in the flag for which he gladly died as the symbol of human freedom and so drawn by the hands of young men lately strangers to him but of whose bravery and loyalty he had been the laureate and who fitly mourned him who had honored them with long pealing dirges and muffled drums he moved forward yet such was the electric vitality of this friend of ours that those of us who followed him could only think of him as approving the funeral pageant not the object of it but still the spectator and critic of every scene in which he was a part we did not think of him as dead we never shall in the moist warm midsummer morning he was alert alive immortal end of article three Part 2. End of Theodore Winthrop, A Civil War Narrative Aborted by Death by Theodore Winthrop.